So my name's Ed. Um, so I, I work uh, with our customers to help um, around container adoption. So I work around uh, within Europe and, and beyond. Um, sort of s similar things to uh, sort of what uh, Jeremy was talking about. So I sort of feed in from a cultural perspective into things like Innovation Labs, uh, but also uh, looking at, you know, getting, helping you uh, find the right kind of services, uh, teams to help you like build platforms, and then also um, how you can kind of uh, build out uh, an approach for, for containerization of existing and legacy applications as well. Um, so, uh, sort of covering some very similar things. Um, what I was going to do today is talk about um, just containerization. So, like taking existing apps and, and how we can get those into into containers. So, I thought it'd probably be a good idea to uh, just walk back on actually what a container is. So, if we're running an application in a container, what 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 we expecting to see? Um, so, if I uh, run an application uh, traditionally on a Linux operating system, then I'll have an, an application. It may have a number of dependencies, its libraries, uh, and then it talks to uh, the Linux operating system or the kernel, the Linux kernel. Um, when I containerize it, I basically do exactly the same thing. The only difference is, is that we tell the kernel to put that application process into a, into a set of namespaces, um, and we can move those dependencies, those libraries, into uh, a namespaced file system for uh, for that application, so that it actually has all of its um, all of its dependencies and everything bundled up together as as part of a, an image. And so, essentially, what's going to happen then is we run our application the same within the container, but now that application uh, is still talking to that underlying Linux operating system. And so we would say that then the Linux operating system that you have is still very important. So we're not virtualizing your application. It's still running on, on that. And that does have a bearing on what you can and can't containerize within, uh, what, what types of applications you can and can't containerize. Um, so why is that a good thing, putting stuff in a container? Um, well, first of all, we can distribute our applications much more easily. So uh, previously, before we had um, before we had containers, you'd have lots of different ways of packaging up your applications or explaining how to install those applications in an environment. Now we have a container image that we can take that container image, and if uh, your ops team know how to run containers, then we're good and we're able to distribute that. And, and also, because of the, the, the way that we build our container images with these layers, um, I only need to distribute the layers that have changed. So if I've only just changed the, the layer that has the app in, then the other layers, which have got the dependencies, if they've stayed the same, I don't need to send those out uh, with that. So distribution is really straightforward and, and nice and easy. Um, it does mean that we're consistent as well. And so the idea with a container is that we don't rebuild our application for every different environment. We build one container image, and then we distribute that across all the environments that we're going to run it. And also, it's the same container image that we're running through the software development lifecycle. So you start in, in dev, you're moving into test, and then into production, ultimately. Um, it means that uh, what you've got um, is consistent across those different areas. Uh, it also means that um, you can choose different uh, software technologies and languages. So um, you're creating a nice abstraction between yourself and the guys that need to run the containers. So if your developers want to use Go or Rust or Java or whatever it is, they're kind of free to put that into those container images. Um, and we get, uh, the from a, a runtime perspective, we're able to, to run irrespective of the, the, le the technology and language that's inside the container. Um, it also means that your application is encapsulated and is protected against other applications and that underlying operating system. And because it has its dependencies within that, if, you, if uh, the ops team wants to, say, patch the operating system or another application that happens to run on that needs to be patched, all of your dependencies are actually within that container. And so we don't have that issue, well, if I patch this, then it's going to have a, a knock-on effect on my application because everything that application needs is carried with it in that container. Um, yeah, so we talked about that, that consistency. Uh, if it's gone wrong in production, 
How do I know? It? How do I how do I test that? Well, at least we know that that container image is immutable. So when I'm testing that in uh, in development, I've got exactly the same image. I can link to exactly the same image that they're running in production. And so it should be a lot easier for me to repeat uh, the the way that uh, that we run our applications in production. The other thing as well is that uh, we see a lot of and Jeremy touched on security as well, but often. Um, your security teams may be interested in what you're actually running. Can you show that, can we audit what's running in production and show that it's gone through uh, all of these uh, governance checks as it, as it passed various tests and things like that? Well, what we can do with the container is we can sign it so we know exactly what it is. We also have a unique uh, ID for that container. And then we, if you have the process set up in, within your organization, you'll be able to then reference that across all of those steps. So all of the gateways that it's gone through to get through into production, um, you'll be able to show that. But if you're just running a single container, well, that's, that's a trivial example. But if in, in real-world examples, you're not just running one thing. You're running a collection of applications that talk to each other. And so how do we how do, we do that? Well, um, that's what Kubernetes is for. So it will take your applications, it will orchestrate them, and enable them to talk to each other uh, in a, in a non-trivial uh, architecture. OK, so that's great. So how do we take the, all those existing applications that we've got today that we've built uh, using our traditional methods, and how do we get them into, uh, into containers? Well, first of all, how do we tell if we can actually run uh, that application in, in a container? So th the sort of rule of thumb is if it runs on Linux, then it should be able to put in a container. Well, kind of. There are a couple of red flags that you need to look for. Uh, so you generally want something that's running in user space within, uh, within a Linux system. Uh, so it's not tied to the kernel. It's not, trying to, it's not a kernel module. It's not got that sort of thing. Um, so typically, a red flag would might be that you've got some code that's got assembler in it. Um, what, we, what, it what is better is applications that are using uh, higher level libraries, so like libgcc, for example, because they'll do a lot of work to map you to different versions of kernels, and they'll stop you from uh, falling foul of uh, swapping between different systems with different kernel versions. Uh, you may have uh, specialized hardware or technical requirements uh, or networking requirements. Th so not all of those are going uh, to work within uh, a containerized environment, so say like a token ring network, as I've got as an example there. Uh, it may be a mainframe application that's difficult to, uh, to turn into uh, an IAT6 architecture. So th those sorts of things can also be red flags as well. And also, uh, important to remember is that where are you getting that software from? Are you getting this from a vendor? And does that vendor support it running in a container? And so you may be, there may be um, a licensing uh, contracts, there may be uh, support contracts, maintenance contracts, which prohibit you from running uh, that application in a container. Those red flags don't mean that it won't containerize. Um, and often, you just need to have a conversation with the, the development team. So recently, we had one where we had a customer asking, uh, well, this application is a RHEL 5 application. Uh, we can't run it uh, because we don't do a RHEL 5 base image. And so, well, um, why, why is that? So why, why do you think you can't take your application? And actually, it was the, the, the ops team for that application didn't support a rel uh, anything other than rel5 so they only supported a rel5 um, operating system but if you put stuff into a container then we're really not worried about the operating system we're worried about the the user space libraries and the application so if we can take those out and then we have a, a supported platform then we can do that work so sometimes you just need to have a bit of a discovery session talk to uh, talk to the teams around that and understand what those problems are. So if it's in a container, will it run in Kubernetes? Well, again, we can hit some other problems around that. Um, uh, if you look at uh, systems like OpenShift, where we are promoting OpenShift as a common platform that's multi-tenanted, you have lots of teams using it rather than one cluster per uh, development team, then um, you know, you need to start adding additional 
capabilities and security policies within that to make that uh, viable. And particularly around security and things like that, we need to make sure that uh, we're, we're kind of um, mitigating any risks around uh, vulnerabilities and things like this. And so uh, different policies and ways of working can have a constraint on what you're able to do in a container. So a very common one that you may have seen if, you, if you've used OpenShift is we don't let you run as root. And not only do we not let you run as root, is that we randomize your user ID that you're running that process in. Now, many applications are quite happy with that, um, but you'll often find there are the, the odd application where you, that, that you'll hit some uh, roadblocks because of that. Um, generally, we would say, well, why can't you change your app to do this um, and uh, to, to be more secure? Um, and generally, we can, wake, we can work a way around that. Um, so that is generally OK. But um, you do need to be aware of these things sort of going into it. The other thing is, is it optimized for Kubernetes? So you may be able to get it running on the Kubernetes, but then um, maybe we can, we're not getting the best out of the platform. And so it's things like uh, you know, the, being able to horizontally scale your application, uh, so making your applications more stateless, more uh, aware of each other, more cloud native, essentially. Um, and so these are sort of things that you can consider. But actually, if we if, if you can get your application onto Kubernetes and you get this workflow uh, and uh, delivery pipeline through a Kubernetes type environment, and particularly on OpenShift, then it gives you an opportunity to then uh, modernize your application then in situ um, and do that as well. So what's a good idea is to start that containerization journey with Kubernetes and not start straight with uh, uh, as you know just doing docker files because if you start with uh, kubernetes in mind it changes the way that you will architect your application and and the way that you containerize it and you'll um what i what i hopefully i'll show you now is that we'll have um, there are different decisions that you're making during that development process and that containerization process and kubernetes takes you down a different road um, in particular, it gives you opportunities to have something which is, uh, you know, to drive towards things like microservice architectures, but use things like sidecars, which I'll explain in a minute, um, and to actually take uh, a logical, your logical design for your application and sort of transpose that into a, a running operation, operational environment. If you contrast that with a traditional approach for applications, um, you typically have a logical design for your application, and then you have uh, this is the physical realization of it. So we'll have a number of servers, and then each server's got its own manifest, and they've got different things installed on them. And so that what you what you end up with, what you actually deploy into production, doesn't really look like your original design. Um, Kubernetes actually gives you an opportunity to essentially implement your logical design uh, within the platform. So where's OpenShift and all this? Uh, so I, I, I'm sure someone's mentioned this already today. So um, so the upstream community, uh, OKD, uh, is um, derives from Kubernetes and a whole bunch of other uh, upstream projects, uh, and creates uh, it's the um, upstream OpenShift community, and then uh, feeding from that <coughs> are the various different. Uh, versions of OpenShift that you can consume. So OpenShift Container Platform being the one that you build and manage yourself on premise um, or in the in cloud, uh, whereas dedicated is a managed service that we offer uh, and online is a is a an open managed service um, that we share with lots of different uh, organizations. So OpenShift Container Platform is certified Kubernetes. So you can use uh, Kubernetes uh, constructs and, and objects and everything within it uh, OpenShift does add some additional extensions, um, but that's part of our work with uh, the community. So why use that instead of doing it yourself? Well, um, really it's about the most important thing in your business are the business outcomes, and those business outcomes are derived by the applications that you're going to be running on this platform. And whilst it can be very interesting to build your own Kubernetes and build all of these services that are in there, like registries and logging and metrics and um, service meshes and things like this, um, it's actually better just to be focusing on your applications. Uh, and um, OpenShift gives you an opportunity to basically build that platform for you, and then you can then focus on those apps. So, OK, using OpenShift. So maybe you're already building containers, 
Um, so you don't need OpenShift to build your containers for you, right? So you've already got your Docker files and things like that. Well, that's great, actually, because OpenShift will, you can point OpenShift at your Docker files, and it then becomes a, basically a build farm for your, um, for your containers. So not only will it build those containers, but it then has a registry where it'll store them, and they'll be nice and secure in there. So you've got your own, you can manage the security and the access of those containers. We also uh, wrap a whole bunch of metadata around that. Uh, so if you've if that um, Docker file is say in a Git repo, you'll have um, the uh, the commit uh, reference and things like this within the metadata, um, all bundled into that container and then stored for you. And so instead of having you know three or four servers sitting there that their job is to build containers, you now can just fire that into a into a Kubernetes cluster and it will build those containers for you. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to increase and reuse uh, with those Docker files. So your traditional approach is to, with a Docker file is to say, well, from some OS base, so like Alpine or something like that, uh, add some application dependencies uh, and um, you know everything that I need for my app, and off I go. Uh, whereas um, we can now start looking at a, a kind of a build pipeline for your containers and going to vendors to get um, uh, third-party containers uh, that maybe you add your own specializations to, and then again, focus on your app. We just, your, all your Docker file needs to do is take the binary from your application and then drop it into, um, into your container, into a base image. So an example of that would be this uh, Tomcat one. So uh, this was based on a, on a Tomcat uh, example that someone had put on, on GitHub. Um, this is typically what you would see in a Docker file. So you've got, you know, we start from a JDK base. They're, in, they're installing lots of dependencies. There's lots of making directories, making sure the permissions are correct, uh, downloading binaries and things like that for the application, putting them in the right place, uh, applying any static config uh, for that, adding maybe uh, init scripts and stuff like this, uh, and then uh, explaining how that application is going to run. But if you take um, an upstream Tomcat, vendor image, uh, we can basically <laughs> simplify that into three steps, which is basically um, get, uh, uh, get the binary and drop it into, uh, into a, the deployment directory for your, uh, for your Tomcat. Um, maybe add some standard uh, libraries and things like that if you needed. Maybe you wanted to uh, connect yours to a MS SQL server database, so you need to pop in the driver. Uh, you just need to add that as an extra step. So again, we're focusing on the application using that approach. So um, designing for Kubernetes means that uh, we have some other choices around that. So instead of having uh, trying to treat your container as uh, a mini VM and trying to bundle in all of the things that we need to, need to put into our application to be able to access it, like you may have done traditionally on a traditional VM, we can now start uh, splitting this out and having a logical design. So kind of rules of thumb, like one process is per container, for example. Um, you don't need to have like a, a sysinit type process that launches um, your process within the container and makes sure that it's always running because Kubernetes is essentially going to be doing that job for you. Um, splitting things out into sidecars. Uh, so we, we, you, if you have tightly coupled things that need to be able to talk to each other, uh, locally. Maybe you're um, building uh, from binary. So you've got like a CI process. Uh, know, for example, um, you're building uh, Java applications using Maven, and you have a, a, a deploy step at the end. It takes the Maven artifacts and chucks them into, uh, I don't know, like a Nexus uh, or a Artifactory repository. That's great. So we can take that. Um, we can basically do a binary build from that approach. So we can take um, the binaries and the libraries that you've got uh, resulting from that existing CI, and uh, we can build new images for you. Um, so that's that's really easy as well. So we can do that. Um, maybe uh, you, you're starting a new project, you've written some source code, and you just want to check that this is working nicely in, in a, a Kubernetes environment, we can do that as well. So source to image enables us to take, uh, you just point us at your source code, we will build um, your source code for you, and then build the container, and then run your container. Uh, so it's all about accelerating uh, and getting you into the platform as, as quickly as possible. 
So what do I do about all of these Kubernetes resources that I've got that describe my application? Well, the, these are essentially uh, just like the code that you've got uh, for your application. So we can treat that as source code, um, use uh, your source code repository to manage and maintain uh, those Kubernetes resources as well. OpenShift will, does a load of work to help uh, create those, so you don't have to like type in these YAML documents from scratch. Um, it will help you create them, but once you've created them, it's very easy to export them and have them as uh, resources that then go through that software development lifecycle as well. So different um, examples of uh, the types of resources that you've got. So things that describe how to deploy your application and how to transition from uh, version A to version B. Um, so deployment information. We've got services, which are the stable endpoints. Uh, so uh, when you have your applications talking to each other, you typically would talk through those services. Um, how are we going to talk to this, uh, these applications that we've created from the outside? So how do we get ingress? Um, and how do we provide specific runtime context? So we talked about immutable images going through the software development lifecycle. How do, I, how do I take that immutable image and make it uh, look like a dev environment, look like a test environment, look like a production environment? So we use things like config maps and secrets to be able to uh, mount within the container and provide that context for us uh, throughout that lifecycle. OK, so let's look at a particular example. Can I containerize this uh, web app? Uh, so this was taken from an actual example with a customer and say, well, it's a Tomcat app. And that was like, great, because we got a Tomcat image. So that's cool. Um, and they wanted it to talk to uh, an external Microsoft uh, SQL Server database. That's cool. Absolutely fine. Uh, they were using the ODBC Java driver. OK, so it makes it a little bit fiddly. We need to make sure that we uh, build them a custom image with that driver built in. But that's actually super easy, so we can do that. That's not a problem. Uh, and they wanted it to, the ODBC driver used a valid Kerberos token to authenticate to the database. It didn't use username and password. And so that's where it became like a little bit tricky. So OK, uh, so we'll need to get some kind of token somehow. So the first thing I asked was like, well, how do you guys do this today? And they said, well, uh, what we do is we install a Tomcat server, and then we run um, a cron job, which does a K in it with a service account, and just make sure that the token is always up to date. So I think they gave a, their tokens expired after about an hour. So, OK. Um, and you don't want to rewrite your code. No, they didn't want to rewrite the code. So, right. so that's what they were doing today. Um, so we said, well, look, um, what you could do, and this is actually the, which is where they, they were kind of heading, was, um, all right, so we, if we create a custom container and we write, um, we write essentially that cron job to sit inside that container that's going to do that. It's going to do the K in it for us. And we can provide like, the, um, you know, the, the, the uh, initial credentials through, uh, through a secret. Um, so we get the key tab and we do it that way. Um, and I said, well, look, you, know, you, you could do it that way, but then you basically your, that application has got that uh, Kerberos stuff built into it. Um, and they said, well, maybe, OK, well, maybe we could put that into another container which sits outside and we somehow inject the token into it in some way. And I said, well, actually, I think what well, the preferred option would be using this sidecar approach. So what you would do in this case is you have your app. Your app is expecting to have a Kerberos token that's valid. Um, but we write another container, and its job is just simply to get that Kerberos token and authenticate it. And they said, well, how, does that, how do the two containers like, share that information? And so when you run sidecar containers, we're able to share different bits of capability within uh, a Kubernetes pod. And one of them is shared memory. So we can have a shared memory space, a, a, a directory uh, that's basically a temporary file system. If I put something into, I put a file into that directory in one container, it, then the other container can then see it. And so we can share information in that way. And so what that means is that we can create uh, a container that just does the initialization. And, and you can then have a standard uh, container for creating um, the, uh, uh, to, for running the application. So in order to, um, to test this out, we did an architectural spike. So an architectural spike, we, want to, we have one thing that we need to test, and it's that we can essentially authenticate our, um, 
uh, get a get a valid token, Kerberos token, using one container, and then show that we've got a valid token in the other container. Um, and so, in order for us to do that, we needed some sort of tame Kerberos KDC that we could talk to. Um, we needed a test application, and we needed to build our sidecar application. Uh, so, actually created a test Kerberos server to help do this. And so this again used two uh, used a sidecar approach as well. And so the Kerberos test server. So we ran a KDC process and we ran the kadmin process, uh, both in separate containers. And they were using the shared memory as well to talk to each other. Um, so it's a bit like how you would install it normally. And because both of those two things run as a service within um, normally, if you install them on a on a on a Linux server. So we ran them in two separate containers. Um, and so actually what we ended up with was this stack here. So we've got two pods. We've got a pod, which is the KDC pod. That's our test server, and it has a service uh, for that. And then we had the application pod, which um, had our application in it. Uh, and in, in this case, it was a uh, because it was an uh, architectural spike, our application just simply did a K-list. So if you do K-list, it tells you if you've got an authenticated token. And then we did the, the k init sidecar, which did the initial initialization. So it worked like this. So there's actually a test script. Uh, you can run this uh, if you've got an OpenShift environment that's running. If you run this test script, it will basically create this as an example. It basically provisions the KDC server. It provisions the test app with the, with the sidecar. Uh, it runs kadmin to uh, basically create a new account in the KDC um, uh, server and then passes that to uh, the application. So I do actually have a little video of it running, if you wanted to see that running. Um, so this was the, the example. Uh, so we've got the KDC server that's running, which is there, it's just starting up. And then here's our test application. And so if you've not seen this in OpenShift, if you look at the pod, uh, sorry, I think I clicked through into the pod, and then we look at the logs, you'll see that we've got both containers running. And then in the when you look at logs, you get a drop down so you can look at the console from one container or a console from the other one. So in this one here, it's showing you the, the console from the k init sidecar. So it's just waiting to get uh, the credentials. And you see that it gets, uh, should get credentials in a minute. There we go. So we've, got, we've actually logged on, and we've, uh, it's got, we've got a valid token. And then if we swap to the example application, which was just basically looping and waiting till we got credentials, and we can see that we've then got the uh, credentials coming through in that test application. No, stop playing, go. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. okay. And, all uh, right, there we go. So, um, what, what I wanted to show here was really that um, Kubernetes changed the way that we solved this as a problem. And it's given us something which we've got very clear separation of control uh, concerns. We've got um, something that's reusable. So if someone came along and said, right, I've got a Go application which needs to do the same thing, we can basically use the same technology. We don't need to rewrite it for the Go application. And it can have its own release cadence. So we've got basically a team then that looks after this as a feature. Um, and that they can roll that out to all of the developers that are using it, and then they have their own development cadence. If you look at um, how this is being uh, rolled out across things like Kubernetes, Istio is a good example of this. So Istio provides um, is providing you with a service mesh so you can control and manage uh, your uh, APIs within the platform. Um, it's essentially using the same kind of technique. So we've got sidecars running against your applications. Um, it, it then supports any type of technology that you've got in your applications. And so the, the old approach of having all of that logic built into your application, you can then take that logic out of your application and have it defined by a, a common service and configuration. So it makes it, you get very clear separation. Um, so explain like I'm five. Uh, yeah. So it does look a little bit like it's a lot more complicated. So if you look at the system, we've got lots more moving parts. But actually, if you look at your monoliths with all of these things in, and you look at if you had lots of monoliths all doing these things, you've got uh, it's all of that logic 
traditionally is bundled into it, and now we're kind of separating these things out and managing them separately. And so it gives us the ability to tune against um, the capability that we're looking for in, in our environments uh, and optimize and innovate and things like that around that. And ultimately, what this means is you get to focus on your application and not um, all of this kind of infrastructure that we need in order to get your application running. Thank you. <laughs>